Well, 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 it's fish fry. Hey there, everybody. Welcome to episode number 504 of this here electronic engineering podcast called Amelia's Weekly Fish Fry, brought to you by eejournal.com and written, produced, and hosted by yours truly, Amelia Dalton. Just call me Battlefield Commander Dalton. Oh, yes, my friends, we're talking about edge-based data capture and AI computing in military programs this week with David Freeman, Edge Senior Product Manager for Mercury, and Randy Hayes, Vice President of Public Sector at Vast Data Federal. Also this week, I check out a new autonomous off-road combat vehicle developed by DARPA that can go just as fast as their human counterparts. So first up, please welcome David and Randy to Fish Fry. Hi, Randy. Thank you so much for joining me. Great to be here. Appreciate the time. And hi, David. Thank you for joining me. Hi, Amelia. Thank you for having me. Appreciate it. Absolutely. Okay, so we're talking about big data, mission-critical AI, and machine learning applications in rugged environments today. But before we dig into the details, tell me a bit about your companies. Let's start with Mercury. David, what's Mercury all about? So Mercury Systems is a leader in trusted mission-critical technologies, very secure. We deliver commercial innovation to rapidly transform the global aerospace and defense industry. It's a very solid company. I've been here in the Edge team now for about six months, and I'm very excited to be here. Excellent. So, Randy, just in case my audience hasn't heard about Vast Data Federal before, what are you guys all about? Sure. I, I always equate this question to office space and what is it that you do here? <laughs> <laughs> I always kind of respond back with kind of a question. And, you know, typically I ask somebody, well, do you want fast access to all of your data, not just some of your data? That's really what we built and, and what we do for a living. And so, you know, for the last 30 years, People have had to make a concerted decision around, do they want fast performance or do they want to save money? And it really comes down to the different media types and having to move data up and down these tiers of storage. And there's really no value in tiering your data other than cost savings. And so if you can solve the cost problem, you can build a solution that provides fast access to everything. And that's really the basis of what the company has built an all flash file and object storage system. We sell at the cost of what your archive costs. And so, like I said, if you could solve the cost problem of flash, you can provide an extremely fast, extremely scalable storage solution for all of your data, not just some of your data. Excellent. Now, Mercury just launched a data center class all flash network attached storage system targeted at ruggedized for mission critical aerospace, defense, and commercial edge applications. So, David, what kind of challenges is this solution looking to help solve? Well, Randy just hit on a few of them, but basically what it is is the customers are finding it difficult to manage large data sets. They're in information overload with increased data emanating from the edge. So I, I think the quote is, they're swimming in sensors, but drowning in data. So we're here to solve that problem. We've partnered with Vast to do that. So Mercury Vast solved this problem by providing dense NVMe fabrics tied to high-speed networks using consumer-grade flash to reduce cost. So we've also solved the storage dilemma by disaggregating the data, making it available at lightning speed with a software solution that simplifies data access and, of course, dramatically increases reliability and density. So along with our ruggedization and swap advantages, it's very attractive to the DoD and harsh environment commercial customers. So can you give me some more details about this rugged data storage system and why it's valuable for these types of environments? Sure. So we talked a little bit about the ruggedness, but to break the system down, there's three major components to it. One's a D-box, which is the data storage box, which is where all of the memory exists. Then we have a switch box for connectivity. And then we have a C box, which is the compute box, which has four C nodes in it, which is where our scalable processors exist. So each one of those boxes has redundancy built into it. So there's four C nodes, two switch nodes, and two D nodes. So if any one of those nodes were to go out, you'd still have connectivity to all of the data so you'd be able to manage it. You'd get a reduction in performance, of course, 
but you'd still have that accessibility to all of your data. So that's a major point. The other thing is it's very swap friendly. It's only 22 inches deep, which for a DOD or a harsh commercial environment, you don't have a lot of room. So everything's at a, a premium for space. So this unit has been designed very rugged. It meets 810 shock and vibe, 461 EMI, 167 power. It's only a 5U 19-inch rack mountable system. So that's a very small unit, very small footprint to fit into customers' applications. But the key is if they're using it and they find out that they need more data or they need more processing power, the system has been designed and the software allows for scalability. So you can add more memory, you can add more processing needs as needed. So as the programs change, as projects change, as customers use it and realize they need more of something, they can just add it. And it's very easily scalable and easily increased. Excellent. Now, let's talk about that universal storage software from Vast Federal. Can you give me some details about that aspect of the platform? This also helps with a faster access to big data and AI ML technologies. Is that right, Randy? Yeah, absolutely. So like they talked about when we first got started, you know, providing fast access to everything. And so if you look at the world, it's moving to, you know, kind of IoT as well as a lot of sensor ingest and processing power. And so when you start looking at those types of problems where companies want to push their infrastructure as close to where the data is being produced as well as being consumed. And so, you know, a lot of companies, you know, try and move data to the cloud or move data to a data center and then process it there and then send it back out. But the problem is there's latency. I always like to say you can't cheat light. There's latency. If you have to move data from, let's say, you know, the UK to the United States, like there is just latency that's built into that, regardless of how fast your networks are, there's latency. And so it doesn't really make sense to move data from you know, one location across maybe a very slow network link and then process it in the US and then you know, push that data back out to the edge. And so what we're starting to see is much more of a edge ingest as well as an edge processing. And so where VAST comes into play is that we build software that allows us to take advantage of the Mercury hardware. And so when you look at the Mercury hardware, it's uh, very dense, very fast. And like David said, the system is ruggedized system. So you can put it in planes, you can put it on boats, you can put it in very inhospitable locations in forward operating bases and things like this. And so from a vast software perspective, we allow you to virtualize all of this consumer grade flash underneath of the covers, but provide you extremely fast performance on the front end of that. And so, you know, when you start looking at artificial intelligence or machine learning, there's a lot of different applications that can take advantage of this type of architecture out at the edge. Excellent. Well, you guys, I think it's time for your off-the-cuff questions. So I'm going to throw it at both of you. So here we go. Now, since you haven't been on my show before, you get the standard off-the-cuff. So a lot of us can't have our favorite foods for one reason or another these days. If you could have one meal right now, It doesn't matter if you need a passport to get there. The restaurant is closed. It's on the other side of the world. What would you have? There's a restaurant that I love. It's a place called Yakos. And it is, they're the hot dog king in the Lehigh Valley in Pennsylvania. And so I would go there. I'd get a chili cheese dog and a bunch of Mrs. T's pierogies. That's what I would be getting right now. I love that. What about you, David? You know, we vacation down at uh, South Jersey, my family and I have a very large family, lots of kids, lots of grandkids. And I would love to go to a restaurant down there that we go to every year. And it just brings back great memories. The food is fantastic. It's an Irish pub. Get a little something to drink, get a little something to eat. And uh, I would have bangers and mash, to be honest with you. Nice. Both excellent answers, you guys. I love it. Well, I think that's all I have time for today. Thank you so much for joining me, Randy and David. Thank you very much, Amelia. Yeah, thanks a lot. Keeping with our military theme this week, did you hear that DARPA has developed a new autonomous off-road combat vehicle that can go just as fast as their human counterparts, even over rough road? Oh yes, let me introduce you to the RACER program, or DARPA's Robotic Autonomy in Complex Environments with Resiliency program. 
This project, which is in collaboration with NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, Carnegie Mellon University, and the University of Washington, has the ultimate goal of rolling out a series of autonomous vehicles that can be an integral part of combat teams. And in order to be part of those combat teams, they not only need to be able to drive as fast as their human counterparts, but they also need to be able to turn nimbly and negotiate rugged terrain. So, this racer program has, so far, conducted two different experiments. Experiment 1 included six different two-mile-long courses, with these autonomous vehicles going about 20 miles per hour. An important key here is that these courses included a lot of harsh terrain that included ditches, bushes, and rocks that could quite easily massively damage these robotic vehicles. Now, this wasn't just a stress test. No, this type of environment was specifically chosen to test the ability of the vehicle system to identify classify, and avoid obstacles at higher speeds. There was also a second series of courses included in their second experiment. And in this set, the idea was to test these new perception algorithms on steeper, larger hills, and to specifically test the vehicle's ability to handle slippery surfaces and steeper ditches and slopes and over longer distances than the previous experiment. So it's these algorithms that are key to the development of these kind of robotic vehicles. Stuart Young, racer program manager at DARPA's Tactical Technology Office, explains this aspect of the program like this. He says, the DARPA provided racer fleet vehicles being used in the program are high performance all-terrain vehicles outfitted with world-class sensing and computational abilities. But the team's focus is on the computational solutions as the platform encounters increasingly complex off-road terrain. So sure, this kind of technology isn't going to make it out of the California desert anytime soon, but this kind of Robotic autonomous vehicle could free up human soldiers to do much more important tasks in the future. Stuart Young says this about the future of this project. He says, We are after driverless ground vehicles that can maneuver on unstructured off-road terrain at speeds that are only limited by considerations of sensor performance, mechanical constraints, and safety. At a minimum, the project goal is software performance that allows off-road speeds on par with a human driver. Cool. So if you want even more information about this project or to see the racer in action, I've included a couple links below the player on this week's fish frying page on eejournal.com and in the description of the YouTube video as well. Hey, have you checked out EE Journal on social media yet? Well, you should. You can find us at facebook.com slash EE Journal. If you're into Twitter, you can monitor our tweets at EE Journal TFM. And don't forget, if you would like to follow my personal Twitter account, check out Amelia D 1978. And hey, if LinkedIn is more your thing, sure, I dig it. You can follow me or us on LinkedIn as well. And we have that YouTube channel I just mentioned, youtube.com slash eejournal. Folks, it is chock full of all kinds of techie videos, including our very popular Chalk Talk webcast series hosted by me and a special selection of fish fry podcasts as well. And by clicking the links below the player on this week's Fish Frying page, you can subscribe to this here podcast through Spotify, Podbean, or Apple Podcasts. And remember, if you'd like to further support this podcast, please leave me a review on that podcasting platform of your choice. It really does help. 
Also, if you'd like any further information about the stories covered in today's show, just head on over to eejournal.com and look for this week's Fish Frying page. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. If you know of any cool new technology or heck you just want to chat, shoot me a line at Amelia, that's A-M-E-L-I-A, at eejournal.com, or post a comment on our forums on EE Journal. For the week of October 21st, 2022, I'm Amelia Dalton, and you've been fried. <laughs> <laughs>